That Great Business Show, Ireland's Best Business Podcast. ThatGreatBusinessShow.com is brought to you by de facto shaving oil, the best anyone can get. Made in Ireland, sold worldwide. Welcome to episode 81 of That Great Business Show, posting on the 1st of April, 2022. I'm Conal O'Moran. All I had to post on social media was the word inspirational, and hundreds of you shared last week's episode of That Great Business Show with Susan McGarry, who went from pharmacy counter to CEO of Ecosem in a matter of years. And Parcel Motel founder John Tuhi, whose teacher told him to prepare for long-term unemployment before he set up his company employing a thousand people that he sold for 30 million euro. And so to episode 81, another all-female show. I'll be asking why Mercedes and BMW-owned taxi service Halo changed its name to My Taxi before settling on Free Now. And Oishi Sushi Boss will be here to talk about her company's push into the Northern Ireland market and a fantastic new software for kids. All of that coming up shortly. These great stories, these great women-led businesses and their business insights and tips are brought to you, as always, thanks to our sponsor, De facto shaving oil, the world's best all natural shaving oil. De facto shaving oil, smooth as. Now, covering most of Ireland's largest cities, the Free Now taxi brand is familiar to most of us. But it's actually not a taxi company. It's a mobility app. And they'd be delighted that I said that before they whacked me on the head. When you climb into the taxi, be it a Toyota, Renault, or an MG, you're actually being carried by a Mercedes and BMW because they own Free Now. Those two brands took a long-term decision 13 years ago that selling mobility rather than selling cars was the future. From a marketing perspective, curiously for me, the brand has changed brand names from Halo to My Taxi to Free Now. So who better to ask about the logic behind those name changes than Free Now's Irish head of marketing, Jane Marr, a woman who, in her own right, has an excellent international marketing career with big drinks brands. Welcome to That Great Business Show, Jane Marr. Thank you for having me. That, what an intro. <laughs> well, you're probably delighted that I stopped calling it a taxi, a taxi I'm grateful. service. I'll because be it ain't honest. a taxi service. <laughs> it's a mobility app. Absolutely. And, and our ambition is to be the um, multi-mobility super app of Europe um, to enable the lovely people of Ireland to, to use our app as we as you travel across uh, across the continent. Well, I use the app and that's probably where one of my interests in it comes from. And I used to use Halo, which became, as I mentioned, my taxi, which became free now. You've confused me. I thought Halo was brilliant. Why did you change? Do you know, um, we've landed in a really, really good place with free now. Um, we've got consistency on our naming a- across Europe, as I've just mentioned. And, you know, Halo was a, it was a fun, fun brand. You know, it had a, a lot of, um, a lot of quirks to it, uh, that I think the Irish consumer really enjoyed. But it's you easy know- to remember. <laughs> it's hail a taxi, Halo being saintly. Correct. Lots of good things. Yeah. You still haven't told me why it changed. Well, we've had an evolution and uh, evolution is good. You know, progress uh, is also good. And uh, landing on, on free now and, you know, the changes in terms of the overall uh, company ownership and, and all of that has brought us to a really, really promising place for the Irish market. We're the market leader now um, uh, here in Ireland and uh, have very, very high ambitions for moving into the multi-mobility space um, in 2020. What year are we in now? 2022 and onwards. So when you are pitching to taxi owners, as in the people who own the licenses, what's the pitch? Yeah, we've got a really incredible driver base, you know, and our our service relies on that uh, really engaged driver base. We're at 16,000 currently. Yes, yeah. So very, very, very big. Yeah. And uh, highly engaged. Um, And, you know, we've got a a very, very strong team here locally to... um, to engage with that driver base and ensure they have what they need um, on their day to day. You know, they're, they're busy, busy people. Uh, many of them will be, you know, family 
type people uh, who really enjoy the flexibility that free now enables them to have. Um, you know, in terms of uh, being your own boss, you know, they're self-employed. Uh, they work with us, you know, it's a partnership. And, it's still uh, part of the gig economy though. In in a sense, yes. Um, but I would argue that that's not necessarily the case here in Ireland where, you know, the industry is very well regulated, um, you know, and we, we have a, a very good positioning versus other markets, for example. Um, it's it's a bit more of a, a free for all in the US in terms of the, the benefits and, and all of the... Um, the, the kind of the, the regulation uh, around this type of, of way of working. Um, so yeah, 16,000 strong and, and growing, in fact. What, uh, what's the total population of taxi drivers in the country, do you know? Off the top of my head, I don't know because we've had a lot of changes since since COVID. Um, but would you so, have half of them or three quarters of them? or We would have certainly, certainly we would have half. Um, and I'm basing that on pre-COVID COVID numbers, yeah. So who knows what went on during COVID anyway? Well, yeah. well it's the post-COVID landscape that's important, you know, um, and people's way of working has ultimately transformed. And, you know, we're here to, to serve that and to, to provide um, our driver base with, with options in terms of how they work. Um, you know, our product has an inbuilt pre-book uh, feature, for example, which which enables drivers to select um, the jobs that that they want to select, um, and allows them to work very flexibly. However, um, you know, a lot has changed since uh, since. I mean, dare I say it? Uh, I think there you probably will not, would not have a guest on here who would who would say otherwise. You know that things haven't changed in the last couple of years. And they all say the same thing. It's all better. It's all better since COVID. <laughs> no, everybody says, oh, you know, anybody who's in business, they'll always tell you it's fantastic, great and whatever. What are the problems? Uh, what are the problems? I would say um, we have a very successful uh, business right now. And, you know, we've got a, a supply and demand equilibrium to meet. Um, we have a fantastic uh, service level uh, for 95% of the week. Um, and the data point we use is a PPR, which is a passenger pickup rate, um, which is really strong all week long. And then uh, the good old uh, social life that we all enjoy here in Ireland kicks in. Uh, and, you know, we, we do struggle to meet demand um, at those peak times. And which would be weekends, I see the data. Uh, evenings, I presume. Pr- yes, you're, you're right on point. Cities yeah. or outside of cities? Or? Primarily cities, yeah. And I say that, um, I mean, do you, what, what, do you, uh, what do you quantify as a city in Ireland? Um, I mean the, the major towns and uh, certainly in Dublin. Um, you know, it's a challenge, but, you know, it's, it's a very small piece of the puzzle. Um, so but it's, it's a challenge. But it's critical as well because, you know, when you want a taxi, you want a taxi. Absolutely. And you want a taxi now. Yeah, and we we're we're servicing that need. Um, you know, like I say, ninety five plus percent of the time. And so, what's the answer so to try to well. fix it? To try and fix it, we're we're working very hard in the background to to improve it. It has improved, mind you. Um, you but know, if you our can't, driver you base can't find drivers. Yeah, our they, driver base are very engaged on um, you know providing a, a quality service, and you know they rely on on the the quality service that the the app and the tech provides. Um, but we're working with, with government. Um, it's actually not an issue that's faced um, in some of our European counterparts. Uh, so we're working to stagger opening hours, ah, stagger, um, you know, stagger how how those opening hours are impacting service levels because it impacts everybody across the hospitality industry. Shut everything at three and there are no taxis. Shut everything at one, two, three and four. Plenty of taxis. Yeah, you you phase the demand and you you meet the the equilibrium more effectively. And um, yeah, it's it's not uh, something to to dwell on. Um, You know, it's been a problem for forever, to be honest. It's a problem that that, uh, anyone in our business uh, faces. Uh, across the across the globe, so whatever market you're in, uh, but it's part of the fun, you know. Uh, it's a it's a task that um, you know it, it's part of part of the challenge that we face. And that must be why people leave football matches 15 minutes early. Would that be? Oh no, they go for the bar. Uh, the well, bar. well, the bar too uh, it tends to attract, <laughs> or, or maybe when their when their team is not doing what they want them to do, uh, that's more likely the case. What do you offer a driver? 
We offer Driver uh, an incredible um, tech solution to um, facilitate, like I say, uh, their working day they, they to be their own boss and, and all of that. I mean, I've just talked through all that. Um, but there are many benefits um, to drivers for working with Free Now and um, benefits in terms of, um, you know, supports on fuel, uh, supports on on what's, our, a, what's a support on fuel? Uh, a pr- we work uh, closely with uh, Apple Green uh, to provide um, benefits and, um, you know, kind of almost loyalty programs. We have um, for our driver base, we operate a, an ambassador program uh, whereby we have kind of tiers of ambassadors depending on the, the driver's engagement and um, they, they, they serve to benefit depending on um, how much they're working. Um, well, one of the reasons why you're here is because I was in a cab probably two weeks ago with Freeview, Free Now, and the guy was singing the praises of particularly going no cash. He has gone cashless and he said two things has happened have happened. One, safety. Yeah. He's not carrying any cash. Nobody Absolutely. Can, nobody can rob him. Better still, you love this. Mm-hmm. He said the quality of the customer has gone up immeasurably wow. because people aren't running away with his money. He <laughs> what said does quality terrible... of the customer mean? <laughs> it means he's not being uh, being stiffed for his uh, for his fare. Ah, uh, well, look, I'm delighted to hear that. I'm not surprised. You know, it is. It is. I. I was kind of about to say it's the future. It's not the future. It's. It's, it's the now. present uh, and it's been the present for quite some time and ultimately certain industries will be slower to to move into that space but it's um, you know there's a safety element to it as you've correctly pointed out there's a traceability element um, and there's a, a kind of a rest assured uh, emotion from our passengers you know every time they they request uh, a ride with us that that they're they're taken care of and it's it's done effectively uh, and it's frictionless uh, mobility you know which is what we're striving for you must have a magnificent stash of data what do you do with all that what do we do with it um what does any tech company do with their data well, some of them sell it Tr- try <laughs> we certainly don't sell it uh, try to understand it and improve and build upon it you know um, the levels of data can be overwhelming. Um, however, within that, of course, we have lots of nuggets of insights um, which you can share inform with our, our marketing um, uh, programs and how we move forward in terms of marketing. Um, Anything unusual that Irish people do in cabs? Well, sorry, not in the cabs. So in, <laughs> oh God. In taking a cab. This podcast is taking a different route <laughs> altogether. Uh, this will be a triple X. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> No, look, uh, we we have had a, a couple of interesting um, pieces of um, data come through in terms of, um, you know, what people were most looking forward to doing uh, post-COVID. And it was interesting. It, it was pretty basic. It, it was getting out there and, uh, you know, getting to uh, yeah, certain I destinations. Need, I don't think you needed data and analytics for that. No, but there was a level of anxiety present at the time, you know, and uh, we all talked about, you know, fear of missing out, but also the fear of getting back out again um, was definitely, I mean, this is back uh, back in January. Um, but certainly, you know... That's only three months ago. Would yeah, you believe it? Yeah, yeah, it feels like three years in many ways. Um, but certainly, you know, we, we've, we're seeing uh, tremendous levels of um, service, you know, and demand uh, required uh, since the, the reopening. And that's been hugely encouraging across all the industries that, that rely on, on this demographic, you know, and to get out there. what about working hours? Are you seeing people taking cabs during the nine to fives or, as sorry, at nine and at five? Is that back again to the old yeah, It's quite uh, levels? interesting, actually. We have, uh, we're building out our, our B2B um Business to business. Department. I should have warned you, we're not allowed to use any acronyms here. Oh, business God. to business. Right, right. Business to business it is. Uh, I can do that. Um, yeah, we're building out, you know, our service offering for the business to business uh, client and customer. Um, and we have a, a program around a, a mobility a budget, essentially, uh, which is a benefit that I have um, as part of working for free now. And um, it is to encourage companies to to consider different mobility options. And So uh, what would you do? You would as the a employer means to commute. give a 200 quid into the bank exactly. account or something. Exactly. Now, is that taxable? So that's the that's the challenge we face actually in Ireland is a, is working through that. Um, so you know, you know the department. If you don't, I'm telling you, <laughs> the Department of Finance will not give you 
anything. I, I it's going to use a, a word, you. but I, you know, no, they don't do that. But what the point I was getting to is that uh, we saw a, a McKinsey report only last week, actually, on um, behaviours uh, for uh, commuters as they return to work. And uh, the results were outstanding, actually, that 70% are looking for um other options, other mobility options, you know, outside of what's been the norm to date. And that's really, you know, the vision and ambition for free now is to to become um, a, a multimobile provider uh, and, and provide that ecosystem that people need. So even currently within our app, you see um, when you, once you put in your destination and where you want to get to, you see actually a public transport option. Uh, so you can actually assess what the public transport options are for you to get from a to B. Um, and this serves to, you know, provide our, our passengers, our customers with the best possible information to make their decision. And who gives you the public transport information? Do you fiddle well, that yourself? Well, I couldn't tell you that now, could I? Absolutely not. No, we're, we're fully integrated uh, with Google Maps, actually. Oh, yeah, so, okay. Um, the other thing that you are doing, which I didn't know until I did a little bit of digging, is that you're working with our former team GBS member, a fellow who was on the show with us, Charlie Gleason. Yes. Of zip mobility. Correct. So yeah. you're not just cabs. You're also, I can hop on a, a one of Charlie's scooters and zip around the place, yeah? Yes, yeah. And we're, we're coming to a point now where, um, you know, we're anticipating the legislation getting passed on e-scooters. It's such Charlie a new form. Charlie has been form waiting for that for I don't know how many years at this stage. Too, too long, one might argue, but I, I appreciate the challenges around ensuring, uh, you know, we're, we're all buttoned up in terms of safety. Um, it's very, Meanwhile, very important. Meanwhile, there are fellas <laughs> just going around almost naked there at 500 I miles an hour. Nonsense. It is nonsense. And you know it. It's uh, Look, you know, waiting and waiting and waiting. Waiting, but, you know, when it when it does come, it will be super positive for our, our infrastructure, um, particularly in oh, urban areas. Thing. We're waiting for, like, how many people do you see on their scooters? First of all, with kids on the scooters with them. Yeah. Secondly, with no helmets on them. Yeah, you took the words out of my mouth, you know, when you're, when you're knocking around um, any urban area or town around Ireland, you know, kids are going to school today on their scooters, much to the dismay, I think, of parents who are trying to, uh, to yeah. curtail them and, and get them to the school gates. But that's the, the native behaviour now that we're going to see coming through uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, scooter as a very um, convenient and viable transport option. And of course, it's it's the benefit of it is that, you know, it obviously very environmentally friendly, first off. Uh, but secondly, it in, it provides a solution to that shorter journey, you know, the one that's a little too far to walk, but maybe not far enough to, to grab a taxi. On the intro, I did mention that you have a background in the drinks industry and you were based in San Francisco and in Los Angeles. Correct, yeah. Well, you know from there what happened with their uh, mobility scooters there. Yeah. Is it Lime and Bird? Bird was the first, And they were yeah. just chucked on the side of the street and... Um, Destroyed yeah, the place, really. I know you, you talk about the how long it's taken to get that, that legislation passed, but actually that's what you've just cited is an example of when the opposite happens and when we're not prepared and when the infrastructure is not in place. And it's a hot mess, as they would say in California. Um, and that was something I got to witness firsthand, you know, the, the growth of this type of transport without the support of regulation and, and some so they were rules. So yeah, they go down the road and they just chuck it on the side just of the street. A, a little bit of, of, of chaos. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's not good for it from a, a social point of view. Um, it, it's not a good approach. Um, so ensuring all of those, um, the appropriate restrictions are in place and uh, shouldn't refer to them as restrictions, but, you know, guidelines and, and rules and help. Uh, and help the the passenger at the end of the day, you know. And what is uh, Freenow's relationship with Uber? A relationship Uber is a is a competitor, I, I would say. Um, yeah, they're they're one of the the leaders when we look at the market globally. Um, however, we are we are by far uh, the leader here in Ireland, and um, yeah, you know, it's it's certainly an open market, and um, there's plenty of room for everybody. There's um, you know, particularly here in Ireland, we see um, a couple of players, um, but uh, Uber not so much. Uh, such, yes, yeah, they've been yeah. kind of stymied in some fashion. I must check that out as to exactly what happened there. How about the future? Because you may sit in the office and you say, when are we going to see driverless taxis coming? Yeah, it's 
It's a it's a really interesting question. I love having this conversation. Uh, I sense it's a little bit of way yet. I mean, it's not in terms of the technology. And again, when we go back to the likes of California, uh, I was there when when Musk started, um, you know, kind of pushing Tesla and, and kind of presenting his vision. Uh, we were nowhere near automate, uh, autonomous vehicles at that point. But um, yeah, you know, the infrastructure again in Europe, it's it's quite different to somewhere like the States. So um, I see it as being a little bit away yet. But one can dream, you know. Uh, but they what started does, what with, the I think, in testing in the UK this week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did so see that actually. That far, huh? Well, testing is one thing, um, but actually um, yeah, enabling to happen. Ah, look at that. He's out rolling his eyes, people. <laughs> He's rolling his eyes. Uh, waiting for legislation is one thing. And, um, you know, it, it is, it's a fundamental shift to to our worlds, to our, our societies. And, and again, I use the word infrastructure and, and our Does ecosystem. Does free now think it's going to happen? I mean... <laughs> Do I, I'm new in the door. We we mentioned this, to, so I'm not going to speak on behalf of the the whole company. But I certainly you've got a new it's a boss new, as well. Haven't you? It's a, a new, new boss boss. We we do have a new boss boss. Yes, delighted to welcome uh, Thomas uh, as CEO. Not that I personally welcomed him, but uh, to welcome him as, as CEO. And he's former CMO. So um, fantastic to see that that trajectory, and we're we're all very excited to have him uh, in place. Uh, but yeah, to answer your question, um, I, I'm not sure how, how close it is. You know, um, it's going to take a lot of time uh, for that for that shift to occur, for the testing to to be done. And um, you know, when we're in a, a beautiful uh, continent such as Europe with, with lots of historic um, cities and urban areas that uh, you know are not necessarily set up for autonomous uh, vehicles, we we have a ways to go. Yeah, but I mean, the whole point is that they are meant to be able to read around corners and, you know, to, How, what, to navigate. What's your take on it? What, are you I trusting? Are I, you, if, I, if I was to park one outside now, would, would you trust it? Would you get in? It's a good question. Probably not in the first six months, but after I see everybody else getting in, yeah. it's like COVID. It's like you just get used it's, to things. It's the, it's the adoption model, you yeah. know. You need some early adopters first, yeah. and um, yeah, look, it's 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 certainly the a first topic of, of crashes. Yeah, or it's, it's certainly a topic of conversation for our industry, you know, particularly in the tech space and uh, for multi mobility. You know, it's it's one that's kind of it still feels quite futuristic, you know. Two last questions. One is, uh, if a driver listening to the podcast who is not a member of Free Now, how does one apply and what, oh, do you, what do they have to do? We would love to hear from them. We've got a fantastic program called the the Manual, which enables the driver to um, receive their license if they don't already have that and go through all of the, the training um, modules that they need to, to get that. Obviously, our website, a uh, great place to catch us. And uh, yeah, our EV roadshows. So we had an incredible event this week in Galway, uh, which was all around electric vehicles and how drivers can transition to that space. Uh, the next one will be held in Limerick. And following that, then we'll have another one in Dublin uh, later in the year. And do you, does one have to, as a driver, do they have to know the back streets of Dublin, for example, if you're in Dublin? Or the back streets are, must be easier to know the back streets of, say, Tralee. Ah, uh, 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 look, there is an element of that that still remains in the test, which is obviously, you know, uh, independently, um, it's structured independently in London, of us. It's called the knowledge. If the, the fellows who drive black cabs have got to have the knowledge. It, they have the best knowledge of, of anyone I've ever met, anyway, that's, that's for they sure. They're, the trained, that's they're, they're trained. And, you, know, you won't remember this, yeah. but one, a taxi driver, a black cab driver in the UK, in London, one man. Mastermind, and you could actually see his brain ah, wow, yeah. was like <laughs> the connectivity, yeah, like and, and the ability to mm -hmm. to to map uh, mind map, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's still a factor for sure, and uh, everyone loves when when someone can when you jump in a, a car and the driver is like, I know exactly where we're going, and and, and the, mostly that's the case. And the best way to go, yes, yes, to avoid uh, said uh, seasonality. Final question to you, Jane Mar is. Who would she, Jane Mara, hire in a heartbeat? I love this question. Um, I did give it a little bit of thought. Well, and good. I wonder if, if my answer will will really resonate with you. Uh, you mentioned earlier you're you're not a sports fan necessarily, but uh, for I me... I sport. Okay. For me, uh, one of the incredible leaders um, uh, that I see out there at the moment is is Jurgen Klopp, the uh, the manager of, of Liverpool. Um, it's a bit left field. 
uh, if you don't mind me Left saying. Oh, 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 you also bitch. said you did, did uh, <laughs> like, one that wasn't intended. But, um, yeah, no, he's just an, an incredible uh, leader. Uh, and what, he, met him. what he's done. I haven't, no. Yet. Uh, not yet, no. And he is... Uh, German and uh, but but has a charisma about him, you know that that people. He's not an really ambassador for free now, and no? he's not yet. No, maybe yeah. maybe after this podcast, he'll be on to us. But yeah, just the the trust he's built up in his team, and I think uh, he's got that that visionary component that uh, I see a lot of value in. He's obviously good because all of those football managers at the most star, the senior level, they get chucked so quickly nowadays. Now they with do. a big fat payoff, of course. Well, but in you're most still cases. Chucked Yes, yes, yes. It's ruthless for sure. And that's what Jürgen does so well. You know, he takes all of that on the chin. He has an ability to be uh, to be very charismatic and not to take life too seriously, uh, but yet gets, you know, really gets the job done. And uh, yeah, he's taking the club to a new level. Uh, a place that a lot of fans are maybe you, are you a big couldn't vision. I'm actually not. Um, not necessarily. I'm. I'm. I'm not even that much of a soccer fan, and that's why it's interesting to me. You know, um, I, I am probably more of a soccer fan than most of my my friends, let's say. But um, yeah, it's just a sport that fascinates me. You know, it, it transcends cultures, and um, it spans cross continents, and you know, it it brings us to us our knees, um, and ultimately, at the end of the day, it, it none of it matters. Brings this country to the knees, <laughs> often, unfortunately. But anyway, Jane Moore, head of marketing at Taxi App or Mobility App, free now. Free now. Thank, Thank you, you so much for joining us on that great business show. Make one small switch. Switching from shaving foam to all natural de facto shaving oil will give you the smoothest, softest shave ever. Switching from shaving oil to de facto helps stop 20 million non recyclable shaving foam cans go to landfills every year. Switching from shaving oil to de facto will save your skin, your pocket, and your planet. DeFactoShave.com Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRentCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy to use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRentCloud.com, 100% Irish owned and a proud member of Team GBS. Small businesses often find it difficult to access the finance they need. Microfinance Ireland, the government-funded, not-for-profit lender, can help. We help businesses who have been unable to secure finance from banks or other lenders. We provide business loans up to €25,000 to businesses of less than 10 employees with a turnover of up to €2 million. Euro. For more information, visit microfinanceireland.ie or talk to your local enterprise office. Microfinance Ireland, funding small businesses in times of recovery and opportunity. All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. Backing great women-led businesses on every show. That great business show. I first met with my next guest during my years on radio. So long ago, she probably doesn't remember. But her story resonated with me and so many other business owners because of the many chops and changes she has had to make to survive and thrive since she established her sushi food business in 2006. The food business is tough. Barriers to entry can be low. Getting shelf space is almost impossible. Once you're successful, the copycats follow. And don't even start about distributing fresh food. But in fact, that's where I would like to start because that's one part of Dublin-based Oishi Sushi founder Kira Troy's story that will leave anyone who understands business gasping for air. Kira Troy, welcome to That Great Business Show. Thanks so much, Cunnell. And of course, I remember you. <laughs> Tell the truth. She actually told me she didn't remember. <laughs> well, it does seem like a lifetime ago. It's about six so years much ago. has happened yeah. since then. But I still remember, and it's exactly what we're going to start talking about, is you started down with the Leo and Wicklow. And I remember this yes. is just from memory now, and that you moved into the city centre, then you moved out of the city centre, but you had to move back into the city centre. <laughs> Explain... Yeah, well, I can't believe the business will be 16 years now this July. Congratulations. That's Thanks a so good much. long time to be in business. You think you'll never make it to the first five years and then all of a sudden 16, <laughs> 16 has passed and I have a teenager on my hands. So, yeah, we're still actually in the Spade Centre um, just off North King Street. 
we've been there nearly 12 years now. So we're one of the spadies. Uh, tell me the story about leaving Wicklow. And we'll obviously you have to give a shout out to Leo Wicklow because they were your originators, weren't they? Absolutely. Um, the Wicklow Local Enterprise Office were great supporters of Oishi Foods, as have been Dublin Leo. Um, and we were under the Wicklow Leo for several years. We were first of all in Kilcool and then we moved to Bray for a number of years. And then just as the business expanded and we needed more space, it led us to move into the city centre. And actually, it's a perfect central base um, in terms of staffing and just to supply the rest of the county and now the rest of the country. But then you decided to move out of the city centre. Why? Well, we're actually still in Smithfield. But you um, moved out, didn't you, for a while? Um, we definitely looked at moving out. and Well, we, maybe I'm wrong about yeah. this. So, did, so you didn't ever move out? No, I definitely thought about moving back out, but... You must have been talking to me about it. That's <laughs> so you stuck with Smithfield. We did. We did in the end. We did um, search for another premises and... I suppose you're always going to have an eye on the market and see what's out there. But food premises are very hard to come by. And even the blank canvases are quite hard to come by. And the level of investment you'd need to put in to make the place up to the BRC standard that we would want it to be. Because you have so many, and correctly so, rules and regulations that you have to meet with HASP and other good stuff like That's that. That's right. Kind of- yeah. So um, our our production facility in Smithfield is fully approved this is the boring bit. It would be under Regulation 852853. I knew that. It refers to the raw animal <laughs> origin of the product. So basically because we deal with some raw fish, um, although our sushi isn't all raw fish, and um, we would fall under this quite stringent regulation. So the good news is we're fully approved and um, we're on great terms with our EHO. Now, I do not know the answer to this. How many people are you now employing? The most recent headcount is 26. That's Plus myself. So yeah. actually, I'm really, really proud of that number um, and very proud of the team. Now we have a great bunch um, in Oishi Foods at the moment. And how, what did COVID do for you, good or bad? Because I imagine that delivery, you don't do deliveries, uh, you're not on, you know, uh, Just Eat or something like that, are you? No, well, although we did actually go on to Just Eat or Deliveroo for a couple of weeks just to keep afloat. So, yeah. During um, COVID? COVID affected us all, literally the sales pipeline stopped overnight, the footfall dropped and the stores that were our best sellers had no footfall and we literally took our vans off the road, made our vans redundant um, and we had to transition the business, basically. That's business. That's business, yeah. Just to stay alive. Yeah. Just, I'm, I'm always really interested in the human aspect of that as a obviously a human being, but as a person, how does that feel when things, you know, none of your doing, you were rocking it, I'd say, and then (laughs) bloody COVID comes along and kicks you in the head. Yes, it's been a really, really crazy couple of years for everybody. Um, At the time, I suppose I had gone off on maternity leave um, in the November before. Thank you. Number three, my last. Um, And then COVID hit in the February, March time. So I hadn't actually been in the business physically for a number of months to that point. So I was very reliant on the team to keep the show on the road. And then obviously I got stuck back in remotely. Um, So it was a new way of working. Everybody at home. They were making their sushi at home. Well, I was at home. I was definitely delegating (laughs) delegating from home. Did the people have to come into head office or head productions facility? Our production, the nature of it changed. The outlets that we serviced changed and how we serviced them changed. Um, We went from working through the day to staggered shifts through the night as our premises is quite small. So just to be be COVID compliant. The people who are doing the... Really tough. Night shifts are not easy. So hats off. And those people presumably have families as well. So yeah, we we have a very mixed bunch of different nationalities. And um, yeah, so it was a really, really challenging time um, where visas, there was a lot of grey areas around visas, people working here that couldn't get home from Mongolia, Chile, Argentina. So yeah, it it threw up a whole different set of issues. Um, Not what they teach you in business school. (laughs) No, there was definitely a lot of on the fly. But to be honest, so much when you run your own business is. So and I think that's probably been one of our strong points is how we have managed to 
handle various crises over the years and just adapt, learn from everything and move on and just keep the boat afloat. When did you manage to break in initially into Tesco? And this is the leading question. Hmm. Roughly. Well, we actually supplied Tesco for 10 years from 2008 to 2018. And then um, there was a switch over to a UK-based supply. Boo, hiss. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say it was a culmination of a few things. Um, basically, I reconnected during COVID times remotely um, with a lot of contacts, a lot of different retail accounts. Good for and you. You took the opportunity to reconnect. Yeah, and we would have done that with so many bodies from Enterprise Ireland who have been a huge support to the business, to Board Bia, to then retail connections. Um, because, as you know, people do business with people. And over the last 16 years, I really have developed great and long-standing relationships. And people move around, you know yourself, within the industry. So who would have been my buyer in Superquin back in the day is now, you know, on a on a Teams call with me every second Friday now in Tesco. So, you know, it's a small world. Because, and the reason I was asking that leading question was, you're now just announced that you've moved into Northern Ireland, not just with Tesco, but with Lidl as well. That's right. We are just over the moon to have achieved this. Um, so yes, in February 2022, we launched into Tesco and Lidl Northern Ireland. So it was a long time in the in the making. You were telling um, me that it took you a year and a half of negotiation, was it? Yeah, there was a lot of planning and I suppose Brexit concerns and then with the pandemic. Um, but we have gotten it over the line and I am really, really happy to say that it's been a great addition to the business. If we looked at March sales, today's the last day of the month. So um, the Northern Ireland sales are accounting for nearly a quarter Get of away. the sales already. That is fantastic. Yeah. And since the beginning of the year, like for Q1, sales are up 74% overall. So to say that we have hit the ground running this year. I love sushi and I just wonder whether it's people looking for that fresh taste or something. Just, you know, it's part of post-COVID. I'm not sure. I'm just making that up. Definitely there's a lot of health connotations to sushi. It's just nat naturally um, quite a healthy product, not necessarily what we do to it. We do as little as we possibly can to it, mm -hmm. um, just by the nature of the raw materials. So really good nutritionals. And it's just, we're taking the labour out. We're putting the work in and hand making sushi as fresh as we possibly can. Nobody's ever invented that machine yet, have they? To oh, make it. you have no idea the amount of hands it takes to make oishi sushi. I've seen it. And I've seen it on TV and I do realise. And it's small and it's fiddly. It is small and fiddly, um, but we love what we do and we do it very well. And um, we're just delighted that we are now sharing our love of Japanese food with the wider audience, which was my goal for Oishi Foods all along. Now, a couple of things, because I keep thinking of questions when I'm talking to you. <laughs> the first one is into Northern Ireland from Dublin. Is that where you're supplying from or have you got a unit up in Northern Ireland or have you no. plans for a unit in Northern Ireland? We are managing this expansion from Smithfield. So we're still in Dublin City. And um, So you manufacture, say, on a Monday. Yeah. And then do they, are they popped into a van on a Monday and then just up to Northern Ireland and distributed or how does it work? It's quite the supply chain. <laughs> And there are a lot of moving parts. Um, but yeah, we literally work through the night to make the sushi fresh through the night to dispatch in the morning. And then it goes on a network of trucks, one of them up to Belfast, two of them up to Belfast, into the depot where it gets picked. And from there it goes out to 55 Tesco stores and 40 plus Lidl stores. So, I mean, it takes it takes a team. And is that, are they all of the Tesco and all of the Lidl stores in Northern Ireland? Yes. Fantastic. What was it like when you got that uh, contract? When, when was that, when did you actually hear? Um, we were due to launch in May of 21. So when we got it over the line in February of this year, we were just delighted. And wow, May to be 21, honest, it was one of those. February. Okay. <laughs> we believed it when it actually happened um, because as I mentioned, the supply chain, it was a bit of a barrier um, and there were a lot of things to sort out and timelines and how do we keep it, how do we preserve the freshness yeah. and, and get over the border? Um, so it's just really great. We're not compromising the shelf life 
in any way. I'll and get on to the very, show in a second because I know from our previous conversation, which was 100 years ago, <laughs> it still stuck with me about the problems of delivering fresh and all that. But before we get on to that, just about uh, the, the, the day, how were you told that you had won this contract that was in your head for mm, two, two and a half years? What was it? Did, did you get a letter, an email, a phone call? Uh, who told you? Or how was it? How was it told to you? Well, we do work a lot on email, and I suppose it would have been an introduction from the um, relationships that we have with the Republic of Ireland buyers. Yeah. Um, no, I mean when you were told that you have the contract, you must have been sitting there saying, "Oh yes." I genuinely. Like Northern Ireland, we talk, we talked about it for so long. I really only believed it when we sent the first pallets out. Okay. So for me, it was just it was just a carrot to, Are you one of these to flat aim cam towards. People? Are you the flattest? <laughs> no, I'm like person? a duck. I'm like paddling away like crazy <laughs> underneath. Well, you have to be to keep the the the, the, the uh, show on the road. Yeah, I have been accused of having a bit of a deadpan face. Oh, no. but, um, believe me, there's plenty of scrambling happening underneath. But was there plenty of happiness about getting... Oh, there really was. There really was. And I think um, as an entrepreneur, one of our maybe failings is that we're always looking ahead, looking ahead. Yes, you have And to. It's, it's hard to sometimes just take stock and look and say what we've achieved. Um, so, yeah. Well, staying in business totally for 16 years is not bad for a start. Now... Uh, okay, we're, <laughs> my next question <laughs> might be about the freshness of food, but I'll keep that for a second. The second one is you have conquered um, Ireland, Northern Ireland. You must be now looking across the water and say, Tesco has 800 stores, I think, over in the UK. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Well, if we can get across the border, I don't see any reason why we couldn't get further afield. Could you ship it by literally by ship, by ferry? Uh, we could, but it, it all comes down to timelines. Um, so that the freshness is guaranteed. Yeah. But but yeah, look, if we can get product in from the UK with short dates, we can we can do it vice versa. So speaking of short dates, tell us about the problem because I remember again from the conversation we had a hundred years ago was that uh, when when fresh food runs out, you get a phone call, and they don't want to know that you're going to deliver on Tuesday or Thursday next week or something. They want it and they want it now because supermarkets don't like. Bare shelves. They don't. Well, empty shelves don't make the money. Yeah. So um, what do you do? And that is, this always has stuck with me because I remember you telling me that was one of the reasons that you had to stay in Smithfield or yes. be in Smithfield. Well, it is a bit of a conundrum, but I suppose the ways of working have changed so much since, especially since COVID. So we've really transitioned from what was a van sales model where we had staff going in to now moving to a more centrally distributed model. Um, so we're actually tapping into mechanisms like continual replenishment systems, where a lot of it is systems generated, um, and the forecasting is planned out. Is so this all in the software? It would be. It would be in a lot of the retail account software. So yeah. it's not up to us to forecast anymore. Really, our job is to ensure that we can meet the demand and that we can make the product to the highest quality and provide 100% service level to our key accounts. Of course. That's good business. Yes. <laughs> where, where are the problems? Tell me about the problems well, that will remain You don't want to me. hear about the problems, Colonel. <laughs> I do, of course, because what you're doing is you're teaching and telling other people in business, it might be completely different types of businesses, but that problems can be overcome. Absolutely. Well, there is no shortage of problems. Um, our main issues at the moment would be around stock, stock availability, Massive inflation in prices. Um, Such as price of... Price of rice, price of fish, how much price, price of, of rice cardboard. Gone how much has price of rice gone up? 32%. And so far? Yeah. And rice? Yeah, yeah. Anything, any other mad increase? Did I see the price rice, of fish almost salmon, doubling? absolutely. So I won't your, your bore fish you and the chips details, but... Is there, oh, please do, because that's real life. I did see fish and chips are going to go through the roof. I think you will be paying 16 euro for a, ch a bag of chips and cod very soon because of the uh, rise in price. It's shortage of materials. Um, so the supply chain is affected. So there's delays, there's shortages, there's price increases. So trying to maintain your quality of raw materials 
and trying to actually maintain a consistent supply of these raw materials onto into the production facility is challenging. So yeah, like we have to be on the ball. Procurement is of key importance and also relationships. Um, so com- communication, what are the timelines, what are the delays um, and trying to then expand your network. We would have been very heavily on heavily reliant on the UK market for getting a lot of our wholesale materials. So that had Brexit implications, um, time delays, import implications. And um, what did you do to address that? We extended our supply reach and reached out to European suppliers. That's very interesting. Like this whole we had to try and buy, bypass so um, that you've bypassed the sterling. Them. Yeah, she couldn't be bothered. I mean, it's just too much trouble. Terrible for them. Yeah. Well, there's there's pros and cons either way. Yeah. Yeah. What are the cons of trying to get stuff in from Europe? Um, maybe the relationships are not as long standing. Sure. So um, new relationships, communication, maybe not as open or as familiar. Ah, but you're a linguist because I know you speak Japanese amongst others. Hi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it I is. was going to introduce the item in Japanese, but then I said, hmm. And do you know what oishi means? No. It means delicious in Does Japanese. It? Yeah. Oh, well, it's a nice word. Yeah. Nice name for the uh, <laughs> product. So I won't forget that now for the, our next chat. Oishi Sushi. Yeah, okay. and we'll have to not leave it so long there next time. Oh, yes, please. A couple of last questions. Staff, how are you doing on staff? Are you are any problems finding them? I would say things have settled down slightly um, and we have had good retention of staff in the last number of weeks. Um, but it is not easy and it's, it's across every industry, not just the food industry. Mm-hmm. So there is a sh- shortage out there. Um, but I have to say, we've a really, really great team of people at the moment. And I would attribute that down to there's really been a lot of um, team boosting activities on site um, and sharing the wins and so sharing the do, journey. <laughs> you do share the wins. So when you got the contract from Tesco in Northern Ireland or Lidl in Northern Ireland, did they have a party? Did you have oh, a bottle of bubbly? <laughs> they did. <laughs> Um, so yeah, no, we've had a, a good few staff events good, and just um, a lot of camaraderie on the shifts where, it, as you said, it's not easy working through the night or even the early starts and the long days that the team have been putting in. So I want to give a big shout out to the Oishi team for um, all that they've done over the last number of months. Um, and they're, they're actually just hungry for the next target and, you know, bring it on. And that target, are you in all of the multiples in the, in the Republic here? Um, at the moment, we have achieved nationwide reach, so we do have representation in all thirty-two counties. And but I would say in we're all in three hundred multiples. In other words, we're I'm not asking in all of the multiples. Who's not taking Oishi Sushi <laughs> from you? We're here to back you. We're trying oh, to dear. shame them. Is it into, okay to name drop? <laughs> of course it is. Are you in Duns? We are in Duns. Are you in Supervalue? We're in Musgrave, where we supply the Petrogas service stations. Okay, so we're in the Apple Green service stations. And we're in Lidl, we're in Tesco, and we're in some independent outlets in Dublin as well. Which ones am I missing? So Aldi? Would Aldi take you? If, if you're in Lidl, you, they don't do Aldi. Okay. Which I, I suppose I understand. I know that's ferocious competition between <laughs> them. Who else is there? Competition is good. Of course it, it keeps is. you on your toes and that's it, it keeps you at the top says. of, of your they, game. Inside they're saying, shag off, I want to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Final question to you, Kira Troy, is who would Kira Troy hire in a heartbeat? In a heartbeat? Well, first of all, I'm very happy with the team that I've got. But in a heartbeat, you know, the first name that comes to my mind is Michael O'Leary. He's a best man as well, a Trinity uh, <laughs> graduate like myself. Oh, I thought you said a best man. Oh, but well, you mean B-E-S-S. A, a, very, a, a yeah, B-E-S-S, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So I know Michael O'Leary did best, as did I. And I know I'd he can be a Michael controversial a character. On, you know, how you run your business or something. You, you probably, I don't know, there's something that I'm sure he, he's actually, I've met him and I've chatted to him and he's actually a nice fella. A lot of that is bluff and, you know. A controversial figure, but I have to say he really changed the airline uh, industry Incredibly. for all of us. And yeah. yeah, no, I just think he's a great character. and He's been a godsend to, yeah. uh, to Irish people to getting off this island and making it cheap enough for you to check out foreign markets, for example. Yes. 
you're not old enough to remember when you used to have to take out a mortgage to, to fly to Europe. And oh, my jeez. So that's a nice choice. Well, I'll tell Michael you were asking after him. And <laughs> please that, uh, do. Please do. <laughs> he's probably a big fan of And if you want some your... sushi now for, uh, for the airlines now, I'm sure we could uh, look into it. I don't think they do food anymore. If they do, it's probably, <laughs> anyway, no, we won't even go there. Kira Troy, founder of Oishi Sushi. Delicious sushi. Thank you so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. Thank you so much for your time, Connell. You're listening to That Great Business Show. ThatGreatBusinessShow.com Viscosity. When you shave, you want the highest viscosity because it helps the blade run smoother. De facto, the world's best shaving oil has incredible viscosity. That's why De facto leaves your face, underarms or legs nick-free. Higher viscosity makes blades last longer. De facto is the best for your skin and your pocket. DeFactoShave.com Small businesses often find it difficult to access the finance they need. Microfinance Ireland, the government-funded, not-for-profit lender, can help. We help businesses who've been unable to secure finance from banks or other lenders. We provide business loans up to €25,000 to businesses of less than 10 employees with a turnover of up to €2 million. For more information, visit microfinanceireland.ie or talk to your local enterprise office. Microfinance Ireland, funding small businesses in times of recovery and opportunity. Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRentCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy-to-use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices, and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRentCloud.com, 100% Irish-owned and a proud member of Team GBS. All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. Do you remember back in your school days when they were picking playground teams? Well, if you don't, that's probably because you were good at it and first to be chosen. But then there were others like me, last to be chosen. And yeah, 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 yeah. It's a lesson in life stuff that teaches you resilience and all that good stuff. But at the time, it was not very nice. And because of this, my childhood trauma, when I saw what a champion athlete was doing with her new business, I had to have her on the show. She is track athlete Claire McSweeney, a former national and all-American champion. Her business called Cool Play, that's spelled K-U-U-L, play. Claire says that Cool Play's superpower is engaging all of those kids who struggle in PE and who don't feel sporty enough to be in sports. Claire McSweeney. Welcome to That Great Business Show. Thank you for having me. Fantastic to be here. Colin. Why were you not here some years ago when I was in the playground? <laughs> oh my gosh, you, you captured it so well, you know, it's... Uh, but you're, is... rotten. you're you're probably running around rings, uh, you're probably doing four minute miles when you were four years old. <laughs> I, I might have been lucky enough to, to be given plenty of opportunities and, and enjoying it, but I absolutely recognize your pain. <laughs> I hated it. So convince me of Cool Play. What's it do, first of all? So Cool Play really is all about engaging those kids exactly like yourself that, you know, just the experience that they have might not have been as positive as we would have liked, you know. Um, and we, we really do have record levels of, of kids and large cohorts of kids really, you know, not engaged or struggling to engage in PE and activity. And I I really felt like, you know, that we're missing out on on and giving them a huge opportunity um, to be active. So imagine yourself. Imagine if you you had the opportunity and and you were enjoying activity and sport. Imagine how different your experience would have been. It would have been lovely, <laughs> but God did not give me the ability to do sports. Well, this is what Cool Play is all about. This is what Cool Play You're is all about. You're going to be one up on God. I'm loving it already. <laughs> <laughs> cool Play is all about empowering kids, you know, through the best science. And we have this concept called physical literacy. So not to get too technical about it, but physical literacy is really a, a very holistic concept that's about in the competencies to move well. So we talk about running, jumping and throwing. How do we learn those? And then... The and we're not born just doing that, honestly. Just like you, we are born, we can walk. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't matter. We it doesn't mean we walk well. We jump. We know how to jump. If somebody throws something at you, you jump out of the way. Oh, naturel. 
<laughs> I, it seems so natural, but actually these are skills, motor skills that are acquired along the way. And so we actually learn them and it, you, you pointed to it. It's, it's how well we learn them. And so if we take in Ireland today, we have one in four primary school kids under the age of 12 uh, cannot run properly. So the skill of running. Um, Whose number is that? This is a research done by Sport Ireland, actually. The childhood. It's so bad, isn't it? It's incredible. It's, it's fundamental movement skills. You know, um, it's very challenging right now, um, in terms of, you know, I suppose forming these foundational, um, abilities, if you like. And so we have these capacities. But as you pointed out, like there's a window of opportunity in which we can really develop these. And so by the ages of 12, 13, if we really haven't a grounding in this, it's very hard for us to, to acquire these skills competently beyond that. Not that it's impossible, but it's definitely harder. And, and, and it's more than even just the, the ability to perform these. Physical literacy is really around the confidence, the motivation to want to do this, to, to have these skills and behaviours to just lead an active life, you know. So what does cool play do or how does it beat me off the couch? <laughs> or more importantly, probably away from my uh, my PlayStation or whatever. Yeah, so cool play is a digital platform and it's really around empowering kids and the educators and the adults that work with kids. So in the PE classrooms or in communities. And what we do is we provide an, a, a curriculum, if you like, on the best practices around developing physical literacy. And that's, you know, leveraging technology. We've gamified that experience. So questions that I asked myself were, you know, well, you know, why can't we leverage the best of technology and meet kids where they're at? Because fundamentally, today's kids are, are, are digital natives. Um, and so what Cool Play does then is in the classroom, it empowers the teacher to be able to deliver to large groups of kids of all abilities. And I think that's really key, isn't it? Because, you know, if you have a class of 30 kids, you're the, they're going to be a wide range of kids from the most sporty to the least. But how do we develop them holistically overall and then make that the very positive experience? So take me, Conal O'Moran, as being the bottom end. What will I do? What does it do for me? I'm in, take a class, fourth class in school. So if you can imagine yourself back in the day. In, I in, do, in your I, <laughs> I loved school. I absolutely adored school. Did you love your PE class? Uh, not really, no. Not really. Do you know what I loved? Spelling. But that's a different story. <laughs> anyway, back to PE. So if you were in your PE class, it, it's all about the experience that we create in that. And so what if it was a scenario whereby you could engage in plays and that play an activity, developing competencies, but in inclusive environment. So you didn't feel that you weren't included, that you didn't feel that you didn't have the skills or you weren't good enough. But Mick and Mary are still going to be way better than me and they're going to get cheesed off because they have to, <laughs> you know, they're, 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 you're as, as good as the last guy. Absolutely. And so, and this is the art of it really, isn't it? It's, it's really about designing that environment to whereby we can create games which scaffolds the learning, but also provides it at a developmentally appropriate um, uh, level for you. So it doesn't mean that you can't participate in the activities at your level um, and that Mary and John can equally do so as well. And so that's the difference with Cool Play is that we can provide that environment all together by creating and adjusting levels and uh, of the activities. And this is a software, correct? Correct. Absolutely. And it, how is it used? So is it in the classroom? Am I looking at a screen which probably... Now, actually, I was never really... I never play those games or anything. But probably would suit those people who are not physically active to look at a screen and might actually be <laughs> defeating the purpose? Absolutely. It's, it, you know, it's counterintuitive, isn't it, that we're using technology to, to actually get people to be active. So when we think of video games, we think of eyes glued to the TV and thumbs absolutely flying. And so what, what, I, what I, the questions I asked myself was, you know, there's some really powerful things and kids love these and, and they get a very positive experience. What, you know, what kid do you have that, you know, doesn't feel like that they're trying to reach for the next level? So what if we use technology and actually reverse that and flip that? So by looking at the screens and by the content that they're seeing, it actually pushes them into the real world to actually try out these activities and behaviours. So rather than keeping them on the screens, we're actually pushing them out. Um, and, and that's really meeting them where they're at. So we're taking the, the, the best, the gamification of what we're doing um, through the best of technology. We're actually applying that and with behavioural science um, to actually engage kids. And it really does meet them where they're at. And what kind of games do they end up playing? Do they still have to run yeah. around a field in the wet and the miserable and uh, <laughs> just 
see where I'm going with this. I absolutely do. <laughs> and this is the picture. This is fundamentally, uh, you know, really what I found difficult is we think of PE as jumping jacks and the punishment of running around laps around a field, you, you know. You were there. <laughs> I you was saw there. me. <laughs> <laughs> but you're the person whizzing past me. I'll tell you a very quick story. I... I ended up doing 10 Ks and things and I was down somewhere like Tipperary and I went out running in the local run. As I was leaving, the fast people were coming back in again and I still, that's a years ago now and it still breaks my heart. Now that's where I'm at. You were probably one of those people coming back in again and I haven't even left my starting blocks. It's funny, isn't it? it? But the fundamental difference between both of our experiences is if I'm enjoying it, but you're not, what if you're enjoying it at your level, you know? And and that's really key because, I mean, we could both play video games, right? And you, we could both be at different levels, but both enjoy it. And that's the difference. It's really about instilling an enjoyment and a positive experience so that no matter where your level is, it's your best and, and you're improving at your level. And so... It's, um, you know, I suppose we can look at, you know, sport is really, you know, a, a great example in that, you know, and I've through my own journey, I've experienced it from, you know, the, the youth sport and right up to the elite level. But there's only that small percentage that meet that, you know, elite level. And really, it's it's the large cohorts of kids and we're not meeting those needs. But you're not addressing just, I presume, the Irish kids. I presume you have an international eye. Absolutely, absolutely. So we launched last year in Ireland, in Irish schools nationwide through partnerships with Sport Ireland and Athletics Ireland in the education system. Um, but really, you know, um, and this is through, I suppose, the, the bigger vision of this is about addressing the, the health consequences down the line. And so we, we can easily point to the chronic lifestyle diseases such as obesity. So the reality is, is that not being active enough is actually an underpinning factor for these diseases. And so the US, for example, or the UAE is where we're particularly focused, where this is, again, a huge issue and a huge problem. Um, and, and really looking at it from the point of view of a preventative healthcare model. Let me cut across because we are a business program, not a health program. So therefore, let's get into the numbers, beginning to feel like Deborah Meaden on uh, Dragon's Den or something. But what is your total addressable market that you've obviously had to uh, do a little bit of work on? How big is the market? It must be, I was going to use that epithet, it must be bloody massive. It sure is. It sure is. I mean, even if we just look at the US market, you know, that's a $3.5 trillion healthcare industry. Trillion. Trillion, exactly. And it's, you know. And within that, your if your software were being used, what do you think? Where's the, the size of that market? Yeah, we're looking at really around the kids market. So there's 35 million children in America. And this is between the ages of five and 12. And that's the market that we're focused on. And you're looking... There must be at least that. There are 360 million people in the state. So yeah. there must be at least 35 million. That's right. At least yeah. 35 between the ages of five and 12. So okay. we're taking a okay. nice uh, smaller segment of that. Um, and so in the preventative healthcare, you're talking billions for this Um particularly because healthcare is shifting towards value-based care. There's a real sense of, and, and COVID has compounded this as well, there's a real sense of really trying to tackle into um, reducing the bottom line uh, costs, you know, and preventative care is, is the way forward in that. And how will you sell or address that market? So you take the states again. Yeah. So really what we're, you know, in healthcare particularly, you're always looking at, you know, finding an innovative business model. And so in that regard, what we have done is um, we partner um, to deliver this preventative health solution. Essentially, we work with health systems and sometimes insurers as well. Um, and, and we deploy then our platform into the communities. So ultimately, CoolPlay is delivered where kids are. And, and that's essentially because 80 percent of, you know, the impact of child's health is actually in the community and outside the medical setting and um, because we're trying to prevent diseases down the line. So we partner with these um, healthcare stakeholders like health systems, which are essentially like large hospital groups or health insurers, and, and they roll it out in their communities. Um, and, and the ultimate line here is we we need to reduce the financial burden on these health systems, um, and because of the the you know the rise in, in obesity and the resulting impact of that. Is that not a contradiction with the Americans in particular, where the insurers is it not in their interest that people aren't terribly healthy? I'm just trying to think that one through. Like, if you weren't 
if you were healthy, you wouldn't necessarily uh, take out the highest insurance levels. Yeah, that's interesting. It's actually a huge um, cost for them. So if we just simply take all the kids in America right now, the predicted rate is 60% of those kids right now will have be obese by age 35. Six zero. Six zero. So from of an, all of them? Of all kids today. Isn't that terrible? Isn't that, that is just pure wicked, it, is that it's being allowed to happen. And kids are kids. They're not going to do it themselves. No. And, and, and this, is, this is the interesting part. You know, if we look at the kids' health market or as a market segment in healthcare, it's underserved and underestim- underestimated hugely. Uh, not too dissimilar to the women's health tech sector, Femtech, which has really rapidly grown and undergrown uh, transition. And so the kids' tech sector is really um, at a tipping point. Um, and, and the issue here is the health insurers and the health systems just can't cope with this. And I'm only just speaking to obesity as one health outcome as a result of not being active enough. So it's in huge interest. It's costing them so much. And if there is such interest, there must be others like you uh, who are in the same space. Do you have real competitors that you hate? <laughs> we don't hate our competitors. We love our competitors. Yeah, you they know, bring... You're on the track when you're in the middle <laughs> athlete, you're looking across and you see Mary, oh, geez, she's on the track with me. I hate her or I want to beat her. So how are there really tough competitors in your space? You know, interestingly, competitors bring out the best in us. And so... Our competitors, um, I mean, are sports, essentially. I mean, sports are providing activity. Anything that gets kids active is is a competitor, essentially. But what's different about Cool Play and why we see ourselves in a different space is our unique approach. Um, and that, And I suppose that comes from bringing together all of the different silos. So we're looking at sport, health and education. And we are, t- we are bringing our solution as a very holistic solution um, to this space, which really differentiates us. And then applying technology um, and science to it means that we're in a space in a field of our own in that regard. And so later this year, we'll, we'll have some research, a research study to, to show some health outcomes, because it's great that we have sport to keep people active. That has absolutely got a place. But fundamentally, we need a solution that's proving health outcomes. And, and through technology and, and data, we can leverage and, and we can actually show impact. And the real reason that you're here on That Great Business Show is because you need pounds, shillings and pence. You're too young. That's the old <laughs> word. They're the old words for money. Absolutely. Absolutely. What are you looking for? Where are you trying to raise money? When are you raising money? Well, you know, we've had huge uh, momentum in the last while. I mean, I'm just back from the UAE where we ran a successful trial. We have huge traction out there. Again, obesity is a huge problem. And with our partners in the US and and the growth that we have and the momentum, um, we're raising our next level of funding to really meet this demand and scale in into the international markets and in the US. And so we're raising our seed round of three quarters of a million. um, And we're looking for investors um, who, you know, Yes, we'll bring finance to the table, but we'll bring more to the table than that. Just that is what we Why is money, as we call it here? Yeah, absolutely. And who's this we you keep talking about, Tonto? <laughs> <laughs> the cool play team, the cool play team. You know, I'm very. But are you not the cool play team? <laughs> <laughs> or are there others? Uh, there is, in fairness, you know, I mean, yes, I might lead the, the cool play team, so to speak, but I am very fortunate that I have an extended team of partners um, in terms of helping us on our tech side and a huge, I suppose, a broad world-class team in terms of advisors, you know, on, on both the business side and the science side and the medical side. So I'm very lucky. So I never like to think of it as, you know, <laughs> it, it surely isn't me. No one accomplishes great things alone. So, But interestingly, in your chosen career of, of uh, track athletics, it is you and you alone. It's a very interesting area, that whole thing of, uh, so uh, I won't often wonder, are you, as an entrepreneur, are you better being a solo performer like you or a team player like Jimmy Heaslip, for example, which is which makes the better entrepreneur? I don't have an answer, just in case you're wondering. This is really interesting because, and, and people do assume it's an individual sport. It's an individual sport when you're on the track because there's no one else that can take accountability. So you learn very quickly, like you can't really rely on anyone or hide in any in, in any corner. But it, it, I always feel like the credit to the team that supports you to get there is huge. So, you know, and if you're part of a relay, which I was, that's a team sport, you know, it's it's on the day. So, and athletics comes down to moments and time and getting things right. You don't have 90 minutes in a relay or, you know, these kind of things. And you, you have a massive support staff 
And so I really liken that to the entrepreneur journey, you know, that I have a, a huge kind of wider community. And that that's even fellow entrepreneurs, you know, who really support this journey. So uh, albeit I, I'm forging forward a lot to this point, uh, um, leading the way, you know, it, it isn't without acknowledging, you know, a huge amount of support from everyone else. Where are you going to get the money? Well, we, we we are talking, we have a good few meetings with investors lined up and we have international interest from that perspective just because of the, the global nature of our product. Um, and so we're really looking to, um, you know, yeah, we're looking for more investors, particularly because, as I said, of the alignment, who see the big vision of this product. But the problem will be because it's seed, there you look for seed investors because the guys from the big insurance companies in the States who will back you when you are bigger and more successful but until then, they'd keep their uh, their powder dry, as they say. So you need cash and you need it soon. Absolutely. When are you closing your round? So we're closing our round at the end of this uh, this month, April. Um, You're right. This is the 1st of <laughs> April. It's going out on, yeah? Excellent. Brilliant. Um, and so, yeah, we're closing to meet our commercial and technical milestones and really deliver on our international contracts. And, and that will take us through for the next 12 to 18 months before we have our large raise. And you're absolutely right. We are, have already lined up interest in the US for that next raise, uh, which is kind of exciting. But, but it's fun, exciting, but it's, oh, it must be so frustrating. You say, yeah, yeah, but I need money now. It's very frustrating at times. <laughs> and you obviously have to, on your pitch deck, when you're t- asking people for money, you must put out the carrot of, how much money they can make. What are you guessing that you might, how quickly can you can you grow and what are you offering them, not obviously in guaranteed returns, but in what expected returns? Yes, so very much so around the opportunity. There's a massive opportunity in this particular market. Um, and, 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 you know, if, from our perspective, we are the level of traction that we have and the growth that we 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 foresee over the next five years is significant, and really the return comes on you know that that ten x return comes on being able to implement and execute on the key stuff that we have lined up, so the key milestones. And so, for from an investor point of view, um, we we offer very attractive returns on our numbers in terms of for the next five years and and, and being able to reach that that ten x return. And minimum investment, and I'm not advising anybody, if you want to go invest, please go and take uh, professional advice. I'm not going to have you in my ear saying, what kind of minimum investment would you look for or accept? So we're open to having a number of investors for sure. Um, the level of investor that um, has shown interest at this point is is beyond, we would say, small uh, angel investment. It's more yeah. private equity and wealth management okay. and VC. Yeah. So that's really exciting for us. Um, John Teeling uses a lovely fr- a phrase for the earliest uh, level of investment, FFF, which is fen- friends, family, family and fools. <laughs> <laughs> well, we leave the fools aside. <laughs> Last question. Who would you hire in a heartbeat? Oh, that's a great question. Serena Williams. She actually, she's an investor now, isn't she? You're absolutely right. And she invests in women. Absolutely right. Serena Williams, you know, apart from her athletic prowess, you know, and, and, and a great one of the greatest female athletes of all time, you know, it's really her journey, you know, to get there. I mean, she changed women's sport uh, fundamentally she, uh, in, in tennis. She took colour out of it. And then she went on to, to, to business, you know, and she's a very successful entrepreneur with her own brands and a, and a VC firm. So it, it's really inspiring. From, Have you buzzed her? You know what? Maybe I should give her a call. I'd love to have her on my team. <laughs> but of course you would. But why don't you give her a call? You are ticking all of the boxes because I'm sure more than anybody else in the United States, she's probably concerned about childhood obesity, 60%. That's ah, that's so annoying. It's crazy. Yeah, it's the world. I said I, I didn't uh, run or anything, but I was very lucky with my genes is that weight and I never had any problems. But anyway, that's only by the way. Will you come back to us when you raise the cash? I'd love to come back. Because I love what you're doing. It's really cool. Oh, jeez. Oh, no, no, that's terrible. I love a good pun. What Claire McSweeney is actually doing is that she is promoting Cool, K-U-U-L Play. And if anybody wants to find you, Claire, where will they find you? You can find me at coolplay.com or on LinkedIn. Oh, well, on LinkedIn is probably the way to go. Definitely. I can't remember where I 
found you. I think it might have been through LinkedIn. But anyway, thank you so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. And that is it from That Great Business Show, episode 81. We'll call it the Confused episode. And please share, like, retweet this podcast with all of your connections on social media and do it now, please, before you forget. A click of button for you, commercial success for us. And make it easy on yourselves to enjoy your favorite business podcast. Press the subscribe button now as well. And don't be shy. Tell your pals in business about us too. And you can always talk to us on our LinkedIn page, just like Claire did. And thank you to all of those, particularly radio professionals who told me they like our new jingles featuring my man from deepest Georgia, USA, and his retro sound. Great brands like Big Red Cloud, Microfinance Ireland, Disney, Virgin Media, Udras Nagata, all advertise with us. Your business should do likewise. And we want to be known as the world's best sounding business podcast. And that's why we work with our great friends here at the Dublin Podcast Studios, including today's sound engineer, Mark Woofer McCarthy. Do you like that, Mark? He likes that. He was also very kind that he pointed out a few little problems that I had earlier on. So thank you very much, uh, Mark. And later on, Peter Rice will add in stings and zings, all helping us to make us stand out from the order. The Dublin Podcast Studios are open for business. And if you want to make a podcast, check out the new website and then have a chat with Peter Rice. As always, the great business insights you hear on That Great Business Show are only made possible thanks to our sponsor, the great makers of the world's best shaving oil, de facto, made in Mayo, sold worldwide. Claire, I'd say you're delighted to have box of shaving oil as your present for being on the podcast. Tell me you're delighted to have. Thrilled. Which is your favourite shaving oil? <laughs> De facto? Absolutely. You know, when you were a, a, um, a world-class athlete, that would have cost me 10,000 quid just to get those two words out of here. And do not forget to buy Business Plus magazine out today, I think, where we now have a regular column all about the podcast. And this one is all about Paul Kyo, Paul Kyo and family businesses and his book. So that's worth picking up Business Plus magazine. From me, Conal O'Moran, that is it. Vormila Bechus, Ag